Shane Lee. I'm a software engineer at SaltStack. I've been there for almost four years. They hired me to be the Windows platform engineer. Um, this is Daniel Wozniak. He's been with us about six months? Eight months. Eight months. Do you want to say anything else? Here, you can talk about uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so when I started, Tom asked me if I would work on Windows, and I said yes. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm happy that I took the responsibility, and I think we've made some good progress. Okay. One of the rare Linux guys that's willing to work on Windows. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I deal with it every day. <laughs> so my name is Rob Hilberding. Uh, some of you might have seen me already uh, earlier, two days when I was doing my classes. I work for uh, SaltStack Professional Services as a trainer and consultant. And I deal with Windows regularly when I'm in the field. So. Okay, cool. Um, we're going to talk about some of the, just, just a little brief overview of some of the developments that we've been working on in Windows. Uh, one of the big things we've been pushing for the last year is uh, getting the PR tests running on Windows. So a lot of times we'd, we'd go to release and then we'd find a whole bunch of things, problems with Windows that we hadn't caught because we haven't had tests running in Windows. So we've started with uh, um, like a just daily test, or, but now we've started getting actual build tests at build. When, whenever somebody submits a PR, we, you'll see two Windows VMs that spin up on GitHub. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see the fallout from that one. Linux guy's got to spin up a Windows box and fix his, fix his code. So, But uh, it's going to be great for us. Um, we'll be able to focus more on features and, and some more development on Windows instead of fixing um, bugs that have been fed in from the community. So um, anything else you want to mention? Uh, Python 3 support's gotten a lot better. OK. And we're making a push to get to Python 3.6. And hopefully, when we get there, we'll be able to drop support for Python 2 on Windows. Right. You shouldn't notice. You just won't have the option to install a Py 2 version anymore. It'll just be Py 3. But it's its own contained Python version anyways. It shouldn't affect anything else on the system. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to give a little bit of background on WinRepo. Um, we're going to talk about how to set it up and configure it on your master. Um, and then we're going to go over deploying software, and then we're going to show you how to add, it, add your own software to the repo, um, how to create a software definition file of your own, and some of the options there. And uh, then Rob's going to talk to us about uh, SSE scheduling. Yep. Okay. okay, so a little bit of background on WinRepo. Um, Windows doesn't really have the concept of a package manager like um, most Linux OSs, and I think they all do, right? And uh, so we kind of had to build one. Um, you'll notice in the second set of bullets there, there's a WinRepo and a WinRepo NG. So NG's next generation. WinRepo was our first attempt at building a package manager for Windows. And the way it worked is th those two... Um, URLs there point to our GitHub repos where we store the software definition files for packages of software. And on the master, those pile, files get pulled down. And then in the original version of WinRepo, you would generate a database file on the master. And then when you did a refresh DB to the minions, it would just pull that database file down. It was a single file that got pulled down. And we, we started realizing uh, some limitations on that when it came to making your software definition file work on different versions of the operating system, different architectures. You couldn't have one software definition file that, that controlled them all. It was kind of, you had to build one for each and it kind of became cumbersome. So we came up with the idea, well, let's, uh, let's run the SLS files through the YAML and Ginger renderer and, and let's expose the grains of the local system instead of the master. So that means you had to pull all those SLS files down to the minion level and generate the database file there on the minion. So that's, that's the concept behind uh, WinRepo NG. And uh, we'll, we'll see that a little later when we, build a, when we build a software definition file. 
So it's safe to say that if you're doing this today, you want to use WinRepo NG. Yeah, uh, WinRepo won't even work on the newer version. The reason it's still there is because some people are still running older versions of Salt Minion. Uh, I think it's anything prior to 2015.8 runs WinRepo. Everything else is WinRepo NG. So if you're current on your salt, then you'll be on WinRepo NG. And we do plan on deprecating that eventually, and it'll just be WinRepo again. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to set up. The default configuration, it's really easy. You just uh, get on your salt master, and you run the update git repos runner under the WinRepo runner, and, uh, and it, that will clone down both of those repositories onto your master. And if you have some older minions, you would run a winrepo.genrepo. That would create the database file. And then you can manage your older minions with that. Um, then you'd run the package.refreshdb. On the next gen, that copies it down, creates the database file for you on the, on the minions. Here uh, are some of the configuration options that are available. Uh, the default location on a master where these repo files are stored is under surf salt. That's the, when you see salt colon, that's surf salt by default. And then there's a subdirectory called win and then repo ng. And under that, there will be a salt dash win repo dash ng directory that will contain all the SLS files that, that we have up on GitHub. Um, that is also when you do your custom software definition files, that's where you'll put them in that repo-ng, don't put them under the one that gets cloned down from salt. Um, otherwise, if you, run a, if you run that runner again, this statement, the update git repos, it'll, it'll fail because it sees modified files in there, or additional files won't work. So it's best to leave that untouched and enroll your own if you're gonna mess with it, or, or clone your own repo. The next option there, when repo remotes, you can tell it where to pull from. And these are the, the default, that first one there is the default. But if you want to clone your own and point it to your own repo, you can change that there in that setting on the master. These are master settings. Um, you can also specify a branch, uh, just like below. And, you, and that's, that would be written in YAML. I wrote it, I couldn't get it to fit on one slide. <laughs> so it's just a list. It's just a list of uh, entries in a YAML file. All right, so this is what the output of uh, the update git repos command looks like. Shows you copying those two down and where it put them. <clears throat> and this is an example of what refresh db looks like. So that, that's good when it says zero failed. So all the ones that are up there on win repo right now are working. And they've actually put some, uh, some tests on those definition files to check the YAML, make sure that everything works. All right, so now we're going to go over deploying software. So these are... These are the basic commands available on the, uh, the package module for Windows. The asterisk means that it's going to trigger a refresh DB by default if you don't specify refresh equals false. And the reason I say that is, you know, it used to be quick when you just copied one repo, the one database file down. That was nice and quick. But now it's copying 260 files down and then generating the database, and it just takes a little longer. And we'll, we'll see, on, on my, I got four VMs running on my Windows 10 box and you'll really get to see it can be slow if your machine's <laughs> kind of slow, so. Um, we're gonna talk about, oh, I was gonna talk about these now. Okay, so latest version will, will show you the, the latest version that's available for whatever, so you'd pass package.latest version and then Firefox. And then it will show you the, give you the latest version that's available to be installed. Upgrade available, you pass, you pass Firefox, it'll tell you if there's an upgrade available for the Firefox version you have on your system. List available will just list all the available versions that you have. Um, Package.version will show you the version that's installed on the machine. Um, Package.list packages will show you that everything that's installed on your box, uh, including stuff that's not managed by, by the Win repo, and including a lot of the Microsoft updates and things. So, um, List upgrades shows you a list of all the packages that uh, have upgrades available. So instead of just checking one, it's kind of a way to check all of them, and that one triggers a refresh DB also. Then for working with the repo, you can do package.refreshdb, pulls everything down, 
Gen repo will recreate the database file locally based off of the SLS files that are existing already on the system. Um, get repo data will give you, that, that basically dumps the database that it creates, just so you can check and see what's in it. It's pretty big. And then package.install and package.remove, those are the ones you'll probably mostly work with. Uh, refresh DB and install and remove are the ones that I, and list packages, the ones I use the most probably. So here's an example of uh, package.latest version <clears throat> from Firefox. It is, actually, that should be all versions, list versions probably. Anyway, should, it gives you a list of all the versions available. Um, here, okay, so here's some interesting behavior on the install. So the first two will install and remove Firefox. If you run these in the, in the orders, they're listed here. This is what happens. So you install Firefox version 60.0.1. Then you run package.install Firefox with no version, and it won't do anything because it says Firefox is already installed. If you specify an older version, it will install that older version. Um, and if you do a version equals latest, then it will install whatever version it finds in your package software definition file there. And this is kind of the same behavior using state files. So this is a state that installs Firefox and there's the output on the right. Um, when you comment out the version line, it just tells you it's already installed. If you do a version latest, then it puts the latest version on there. And then you also have a package.latest. If you're too lazy to do version equals latest, you can just do package.latest. And that's kind of in line with uh, what's available on Linux. So we try to, that's, that's the reason we do this is to try to uh, normalize things across operating systems. So you can do a package.install and you don't have to know the underlying uh, command lines for it. Um, you can also install multiple packages. Uh, for example, using the packages uh, parameter and it's a, it's a list and it can also be a list of dictionaries. So if it's a list of dictionaries, you, you can specify the versions. So 7-zip is going to install the latest version available when Skippy is going to install whatever version I specified. If you don't put a version there, it'll just install the latest version. All right, you guys have any questions on so far on how the package manager works? Okay, so now we're going to get into a um, little more detail on managing your own software. So this would be stuff that's not already up on the Win repo, up on GitHub. And it would also be in case you want to make changes to that, um, submit new versions or new pieces of software. So in this example, I've listed the contents of repo ng. You can see there's an MS Office directory there, uh, my win repo, another repo that maybe I cloned down. Maybe I got a thing for installing PyCharm, and then there's the default salt win repo ng. Um, so when you run package.refreshdb, it will copy everything that's in that repo-ng directory. All the SLS files, it will ignore everything else. So you can store executables here, setup files, everything you need can be in subdirectories here. The only thing that will get copied down to the minion are the, the software definition files. Um, and it does it in alphabetical order. And then again, do not put the custom SLS files in the saltwin repo ng directory, because that'll mess you up when you run that update git repos command. So I was trying to find something that I could show you guys that wasn't already up on the repo that we could work with, and VS Code's kind of new, I guess, so, so we thought I'd show you how to do that. So I've, I've already done the steps of making the directory, and I put the 32-bit and the 64-bit EXEs in that same directory. And so we're going to give this a go. So here is the code. Can I copy and paste from here? No, I have to kill it. So. All right, so we're going to just copy this code out of here. So I have a master running here on my Windows box, and we are going to we're going to create this file. So so I'm in I'm already in the directory VS Code. You can name the file whatever you want because it's going to copy all the SLS files down. 
but I like to call it init when it's already in a directory with the name that I want. So I'm going to create an init.sls. Okay. And I'm going to paste all that stuff in there that we just, I just pulled off that slide. And now I have, so there's our new software definition file. And the way this works is uh, VS Code is the name, that first line is the name of the, of the software as I'm going to call it when I'm trying to install it. So package.install VS Code. Okay, so that's, that's what that would be. The next one is the version. Um, you need to enclose it in a single quote. Otherwise, the YAML parser, if it like ends with a zero, it'll drop the zeros. It does, it does weird things, so you have to put it in a single quotes so that it keeps that full version number there. The full name has to match exactly as it appears in like add remove programs or in the, in the registry. So, and you can pull that out of the, the MSI if it's an MSI or however you got to get it. The, the way I do it is I just install the software on a box and then I go look at it and see what's, what they call it and then I put that in there and then and that's what I use. When I, when I went to, we're, we're going to talk about a couple different options here for the installer. Um, in this one we're using, a, we're using the salt file system. Uh, so that means salt colon slash slash that, that refers to serve salt, the default, and then win repo ng vs code and the full path there from that point on up to the executable. Um, install flags. And, and I'm going to demonstrate this a little bit later. The software you're installing has to be able to install silently without popping up any dialogues or else it's not, it's not going to work. Um, salt runs as a service, so any dialogues that pop up are going to pop up in that service environment. You're not going to be able to see them and close them and it's just going to sit there hanging. Okay. So you have to be able, you have to figure out what the command line switches are to make that package install silently. And you can usually Google them and find them. I think this is pretty standard for Microsoft based stuff to do the silent. And, um, the merge task run code, that's a special thing just for VS code. It pops up a, a little prompt at the end that says, do you want to run, do you want to launch VS code? So that merge tasks with the exclamation point tells it don't do that one. It like unsets that flag on the installer. They're all different, so each one you kind of have to figure out how to make it install silently. Um, and then that's just a points to the un uninstaller with the same flags. This is not an MSI, so we're saying MSI false. If you say MSI true, it's going to prepend that with MS MSI exec slash I, and then it'll be pointing to the to the MSI you're installing. And then if you want to reboot. So this is a pretty simple um, software definition file. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, save this, and we're going to refresh the database on all my machines. I'm adding a time of 90 seconds. The default is to wait seven seconds for a minion to return. Since I'm running four VMs on this thing and it's really slow, I'm putting 90 so that it doesn't time out. And that's all, I'm selecting all my minions, and we're going to do package dot refresh db so that's going to pull all of my all of the package that I have I have the entire repo on there and it's going to generate the database file so they're all going now you see the little percentage sign if you can read that small I couldn't make that bigger so it takes a little while to run you'll see them start checking in here in a bit Where is the master running right now? All right, so I have a master running on my Windows box here. So that's the, on the local box, and then you have VMs. So the master's on my laptop, and then I have four VMs running inside my laptop, and I set up a little virtual network on there. Uh, for the, uh, like, installer definition file that you just made, for the installer key, uh, can that be any web server, like, where the installer is? Yeah, so as long as, the, re the reason I did this one that way is because when I tried to get a link from Microsoft, it was like a randomized link. Yeah. It wasn't like, so I said, okay, we'll copy them down. When I tried to do the direct link, it was like one of those link ID equals and then some number, and it wasn't resolving. 
So I just pulled the files down and put them on here. But yeah, it can be an HTTP, FTP, it can be um, any number of locations. It might be able to be a, U, a UNC or a, what do they call it, a file share, like a file share. So you could put it somewhere else. You could store your EXE somewhere else on another server and keep your, they just have to point to it. It has to be accessible by the minion. Okay. <clears throat> any other questions while this is going? Everybody having a good time? Well, maybe, uh, so Shane, whether you, whether you did the, the, uh, the custom installer, uh, I want to point out um, two other flags you can use, which is called cache file and cache dir. That means in case you have an MSI, you know, and you have all these, and you want to make it really silent, you know, how MSI work a lot of times, they ask you for a lot of options. You know, are you sure you want to do this? You know, and you want to, you have to fill in this certain parameter to continue on. <clears throat> so if you would create an MSP file, you know, an answer file for that, you could put that directly where you store your MSI and then pass on the option of cache underscore there. That means at that point, everything where it's, it, where that MSI is located will be copied down to the minion also. And then you can potentially, in your installation command, do the MSI, you know, passing on that it is using an MSP for all the configuration settings. Right, I was going to talk, I had the slide for that a little bit later. But. <laughs> <laughs> so you could do a, like a transform file for yeah. installing Microsoft Office. And there's two, there's cache file and cache dir. If you do cache dir, that caches everything that's in the same directory as the executable here. You're calling, and in that you could have a transform file and have that as part of your installer args for like a Microsoft Office. All right, I think it finished. It, it didn't finish before I hit my 90 seconds, but all my VMs are zero now, so they're done running. So now we're gonna do a package.list packages. Let's see if, uh, make sure I remove VS Code before I. <laughs> Good times. No, it's not. All right, so it looks like I got it off. For some reason, my Windows Server ones are slower than my Windows 7 ones. Okay, all right, so you see VS Code's not there. If uh, the, the way you can tell if something is being managed by salt is there are these little single word names like this. Once you get up in here and you start seeing this stuff, that's just software that's on the system that's not necessarily managed by salt. If it finds a match in that database file, then you'll see that one line name you put at the top of your top of your SLS file. You'll see that one line name. So all these are managed by salt. Um, all right, so done list package. We're going to install VS Code now. And, and I'm showing you this on purpose. The Windows 7 32-bit one is going to fail. Okay? Anybody want to take a... Oh, dang it. Anybody want to take a stab as why it's going to fail? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's going to fail because uh, on our definition file... We, uh, we only p defined the 64-bit version of the installer. So I guess I might as well just pull it up because we're going to have to fix it anyways. All right, so the way this looks is you see this thing running right here. It's really small, I know. It's, it's the VS Code setup. It launched it, but it's the 64-bit version. And there's a window sitting there on the system telling you that it's, this, is, this package is for a 64-bit box. It won't run on, the wrong, the architecture's wrong, it's telling you. 
Okay, so you just have to come in here and kill it. And if you if you want to see the error, you can just copy a 64-bit and copy it and uh, run it, and show you, it'll show you the error. I had three Python processes. I should have told you that. And once I killed that, it it released the other one, and now the minion returned back. The minion is sitting there waiting for the program to return, okay? and it can't because it's got a dialog box popped up. Okay, so that's why the the quiet thing is very important. But I'm going to show you how to fix that. So this is uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to run this through the, the YAML parser, the Jinja parser. And I've already pre-written the Jinja here. And we'll put it in our file, recopy it down. I've got a set paste here. If you don't set paste, it messes up your indenting. All right, so just to go through this, what it does is it checks the CPU arch grain and it's looking for AMD 64. And if it finds AMD 64, then it's saying use this, use this file as the installer, as the installer name. Otherwise, we're just going to go with the 32-bit. So down here, we need to put our, put the name of our installer in here. Let me get to the end. All right, so that will, that will pretty much fix this one. So now that we've modified this, now we have to do another refresh DB, okay? So we've got to copy everything down and regenerate this. Anybody got any good jokes? <laughs> I tell you a UDP joke, but you probably put it together. Oh, nice. Now we ask for a good joke. My mom wouldn't get that one either. I hesitate to ask. <laughs> this is like the room for we'll, bad we'll, dad we'll jokes. Tell it <laughs> All I know are like offensive jokes. This isn't offensive unless you're a snail. <laughs> Good times. We're going to be looking at ways to make speed this up quite a bit. Right now, it's going through and <clears throat> regenerating every file, whether it really needs to or not. So we're going to look at using some hashing to make sure that we're only regenerating stuff that has actually changed. Should be a significant improvement in this. Seemed faster earlier. Is this during the whole time? Like going through it? Well, it copies them all down first, and then it, and then it goes through each one and, and goes through the ginger, parses everything, checks the grains. Some of them even have uh, um, salt functions are exposed that get run to check uh, different things, compare versions. Right, yeah. It pulls them all down, then goes through them one at a time. It's fast on Amazon. It's slow on <laughs> my box. Do I? Okay. All right. So they just they just finished. So now we're going to do the install again. Uh, the other one should return pretty quick. Dang! I did the wrong one again. There we go. <clears throat> The other ones will return an empty dictionary just saying that it's already in installed. That just means it's already there. That confused me at first when I first worked at Solve. I was like, why? Well, it's just a line with nothing. You'll see. Let me 
it comes up. I like feedback as a Windows guy. I like a, to have a nice OK button that I know it works. See, like that. What does that mean? I hated that when I first started. I was like, you tell me something. <laughs> Did it work? Did it not work? Guess that means it worked or it didn't need it. We can look at our window seven. See if it's hung up. Anybody see that name there? It says IA32 instead of 64. So that's good. It means it's running the right one. All right, that one's gonna that one's gonna return here pretty quick. <clears throat> Sure, yeah. So on that, with the custom SLX file, um, the game installer one, there's no reason that that is a line that can't point to like an MSI or PSC that's already on the menu or something like that. Yeah, you could point it to any, anywhere that it, the menu can access. It could be a C colon software in the name of the file. Yeah, it can be anywhere. Um, it. I'm not sure. I've never tried. It may copy that file into the minions cache. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though it's local, I, I'm not sure what exact how it'll behave there, because because it copies it down to location, then it just launches. It takes everything off the front of the file name and just runs the file name with your switches in the cache location. So it may not differentiate that this is actually running on locally already. Um, it's not that smart yet. I don't know. I haven't tested that, so that'd be my guess. All right, so we fixed it, right? So install VS Code 1.261. So that's a real easy one. Um, I'm not going to run through the pain of doing a whole bunch of refresh DBs anymore, but I'm going to show you. Here's another, here's another one. Let me make this big for you. So this one was one for OBS Studio. Um, it's, a, it's like a podcasting YouTube streaming piece of software and this one is it points to a github place instead of to a to the salt right instead of salt colon it's uh, https uh, you can just ignore that ginge up there at the top um, so you can see the same the name of the file when i install this i'm going to say salt package.install obs and uh, there's the version so this is one version and one bitness of the software so it's like the 64-bit version so let me show you I made another one and I, I tested this so I know it works um, so let me let me just show you this directory the only thing in it is the init file okay so the software is actually going out to their place and, and downloading it so Okay, so when I got on their site, there were several versions available. Okay, I'll, and it even went past this, but I did the top four versions that I found on their site. 22.0.2, um, so that, that's basically just a list of all the versions available. And then you guys recognize this from the above, from the previous example, where it gets the architecture. So now down here is our, the name, and then we have a little for loop here. So it's for version in version. So for that, notice where it is. It's after the it's after that first label, right? The OBS, because it's going to be OBS is going to be the top level, and then under that it's going to have a version. It's going to create another like a database entry for each version that it has, and then under that there's going to be all the information to install it. So I, I set a base URL because it was getting too long to fit on one screen, um, which is just the root of where it's downloaded from. So it's OBS Studio releases download. And then here's the version. So this, the, the single version that's, that it's pulling with the for loop will go right here. It's in the single quote, so it won't trim any of the zeros off. I have the full name. And then right here in this line, I'm doing a, I'm running a salt command, a package compare versions. So the reason I had to do this was when I started looking at the names of the installer files, some of them 
the newer versions, they added Arch, the like X64. They added whether it was AMD 64 or whether it was 32-bit. And in the older versions, it was just a single installer with no names on it. So I kind of had to say, well, if it's newer than, if it's this version or newer, then we're going to add the Arch to the file name. Otherwise, it's just going to be this name. And then everything else is pretty much the same. This is a, looks like it's a Nullsoft installer, so it's, it installs silently with a slash S, capital S, and everything else is kind of the same. So uh, any, any questions on this? Yeah. For the installer, do you have spaces in the, the directory path file name? Is that okay to leave like that? Can you put that in quotations? No, it's the YAML renderer. Anything on that line, the entire line after the colon is seen as the, as the string. You don't have to quote it unless there are some special characters that you need to escape that are getting caught by the renderer. So, yeah, I've, I've seen people quote them, single quotes, doubles, and I've had better luck just not quoting them at all Okay, on the, in the YAML renderer. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, the base off, so that would be like under features, add remove yeah. features. Um, so on the on the servers, we do we can do roles. We can add and remove roles. I'm not sh I'm not sure how that works on the desktop. I'm not sure if that's available on the desktop to add features. I don't know. I don't think the roles system is available. Um, as far as installing SQL Server. If you can install it silently with some command line switches, this will do it. But what I've seen is uh, I've seen guys launch some pretty complicated PowerShell scripts and things that will install SQL Server and, and set them up. And, and I, I actually, one of the packages I made for testing, I was testing Unicode translation between the Python environment and the Windows environment, and it creates a an entry in add remove programs that has an enye in it, you know, the little n with a squiggly on top, and and it's just a batch file. So this thing just so if you can even put it in a batch file and run it, this can do it. You know, I had it set. All it did the the, the batch file just create a registry entry with an enye into the add remove programs, and then it catches it. And, and then when I did a list packages, it shows up software with an enye. You know, so if you can do it in a batch file, you can you can do it here. You can get kind of creative with it. Any other questions? I haven't repeated a single question like I was supposed to. <laughs> For that, I apologize. Okay. Sure. Oh, right here, yeah, the concat. So it adds the version at the end here. It's not a plus, it's a tilde. Did everybody see that? And this, it's kind of confusing because it flips over to the next line, but that's all just one line. Yeah, that's a good point. In the salt documentation, we have a section that talks all about the nuances of Jinja and what to avoid and how to overcome the problems that you encounter. Okay, all right, I'm going to try to... Did I have any? I had some pitfalls. Did you want to just, you have five minutes? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'll put these slides up on, you can look at the additional uh, parameters that are available on the software definition files. There's a few more that I didn't go over, um, but Rob needs some time to talk about SSE scheduling. So it's going to be so amazing. All right, I will just use uh, this mic. Um, so a little bit about what uh, Shane said. One of the things which is kind of important is that uh, package refresh DB, you know, runs on a regular schedule, or actually a lot of times people forget it when you add new uh, 
uh, repo definition files. So one of the nicest thing what's happening into 5.5 SSE, which is coming out soon, is that we add a scheduler in there. So I have a simple job here, update package.db, which is just gonna do the package refresh DB. I have a predefined target running every Windows system. The next thing I will do is I will go to the scheduler, create a schedule, give it the name, refresh DB, pick my job, which I already did. That package DB. As you see, because I already had a predefined target in the job, it will pre populate here. It's already set. And now I can start scheduling. I can do a recurring, like, okay, I run this every hour. Or I can do, you know, I want to run this on a repeated date and time. Instead of daily, I can do it weekly. And then say, you know what, I want to run it on Sunday, I want to run it on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And then I can set different times. Here I want to run it at 2 o'clock. Here I want to run it at 1 o'clock. Another one, let's do it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm trying to speed up so we end this in time. <laughs> okay, so I set my schedule completely. Do a save. It's done. Now I can look here at upcoming, and you will see here it's all scheduled, right? It's going to run here at uh, September 13, at this time, September 15, and so on and so on. The next thing what you can do then, let's say like, hey, I want to run this, I scheduled it, but I want you to skip this on September 16. So I can select that schedule, do a skip, skip the whole schedule, at that point it won't run. Yes. Or I can directly disable or enable the whole schedule. One of the other things besides package management, which might be helpful, especially since we're talking about Windows now, and I mentioned that anybody who went through my pre-conference classes, is when we do patching, we know Windows likes a reboot, correct? So. <laughs> I can schedule reboots, but I only want to reboot if a reboot is needed. Yes, not just reboot all those systems every day if there is no reboot needed. So there is a simple module for that, which you can use by writing a simple state. Which I have here is my Windows updates, which is a reboot state file, which does nothing else than set reboot do remote execution, use the WinWA module, and it's like, hey, gets needs reboot. If that comes back as true, then I'm gonna do a system reboot, otherwise I'm gonna kind of end gracefully by using a test, configurable test state, like, no, I don't need a reboot, that's it. So now nothing will stop me to schedule this to potentially run every day after business hours, yes? And it will only reboot if a reboot is needed. Okay, so that concludes us. We have one minute left. Any questions? Where is the files going to be available? They told me I could upload them. They told me I could upload them into the little schedule under my talk, so I'll, I'll upload it under my talk on, the, on your little app. All right, I think that's uh, 2.30. We made it in time. <laughs> Thanks, guys.